morning, friends. We're on chapter 11, Nightgown. We had lain thus in bed, chatting and napping at short intervals, and Queequeg, now and then affectionately throwing his brown tattooed legs over mine, and then drawing them back so entirely sociable, sociable and free and easy we were, when at last, by reason of our confabulations, what little nappishness remained in us altogether departed, and we felt like getting up again, though daybreak was yet some way down the future. Yes, we became very wakeful, so much so that our recumbent position began to grow wearisome, and by little and little we found ourselves sitting up, the clothes well tucked around us, leaning against the headboard with our four knees drawn up close together, and our two noses bending over them, as if our knee pans were warming pans. We felt very nice and snug, the more so since it was so chilly out of doors, indeed out of bedclothes too, seeing that there was no fire in the room, the more so I say, because truly to enjoy bodily warmth some small part you must some small part of you must be cold and there is no quality in this world that is not what it is merely by contrast nothing exists in itself if you flatter yourself that you are all over comfortable and have been so a long time then you cannot be said to be comfortable any more but if like queequeg and me in the bed the tip of your nose or the crown of your head be slightly chilled, why then, indeed, in the general consciousness, you feel most delightedly and unmistakably warm. For this reason, a sleeping apartment should never be furnished with a fire, which is one of the luxurious discomforts of the rich. For the height of this sort of deliciousness is to have nothing but the blanket between you and your snugness and the cold of the outer air. Then there you lie like the one warm spark in the heart of an arctic crystal." We had been sitting in this crouching manner for some time, when all at once I thought I would open my eyes, for when between sheets, whether by day or by night, and whether asleep or awake, I have a way of always keeping my eyes shut, in order the more to concentrate the snugness of being in bed, because no man can ever feel his own identity aright except his eyes be closed, as if darkness were indeed the proper element of our essences, though light be more congenial to our clayey part. Upon opening my eyes then, and coming out of my own pleasant and self-created darkness, into the imposed and coarse outer gloom of the unilluminated twelve o'clock at night, I experienced a disagreeable revulsion. Nor did I at all object to the hint of Queequeg that perhaps it were best to strike a light, seeing that we were so wide awake. And besides, he felt a strong desire to have a few quiet puffs from his tomahawk. Be it said, that though I had felt such a strong repugnance to his smoking in bed the night before— Yet see how elastic our stiff prejudices grow when love once comes to bend them. For now I liked nothing better than to have Queequeg smoking by me, even in bed, because he seemed to be full of such serene household joy then. I no more felt unduly concerned for the landlord's policy of insurance. I was only alive to be condensed confidential comfortableness of sharing a pipe and a blanket with a real friend. With our shaggy jackets drawn about our shoulders, we now passed the tomahawk from one to the other till slowly there grew over us a blue hanging tester of smoke illuminated by the flame of the new-lit pipe. Whether it was that this undulating tester rolled the savage away to far-distant scenes, I know not, but he now spoke of his native island, and eager to hear his history, I begged him to go on and tell it. He gladly complied, though at the time I but ill comprehended not a few of his words, yet subsequent disclosures, when I had become more familiar with his broken phraseology, now enable me to present the whole story such as it may prove in the mere skeleton I give. Chapter 12. Biographical. Queequeg was a native of, native of Cocovoco, an island far away to the west and south. It is not down on any map. True places never are. When a new hatched savage, running wild about his native woodlands in a grass clout, followed by nibbling goats, as if he were a green sapling, even then, in Queequeg's ambitious soul lurked a strong desire to see something more of Christendom than a specimen whaler or two. His father was a high chief, a king, his uncle a high priest, and on the maternal side he boasted aunts who were the wives of unconquerable warriors. There was excellent blood in his veins, royal stuff, though sadly vitiated, I fear, by the cannibal propensity he nourished in his untutored youth. A sag harbor ship visited his father's bay, and Queequeg sought a passage to Christian lands. But the ship, having her full complement of seamen, spurned his suit, and not all the king his father, and not all the king his father's influence could prevail. But Queequeg vowed a vow. Alone in his canoe, he paddled off to a distant strait, 
which he knew the ship must pass through when she quitted the island. On one side there was a coral reef, on the other a low tongue of land, covered with mangrove thickets that grew out into the water, hiding his canoe still afloat among these thickets with its prow seaweed. He sat down in the stern, paddle low in hand, and when the ship was gliding by, like a flash, he darted out, gained her side, with one backward dash of his foot capsized, and sank his canoe, climbing up the chains and throwing himself a at little at full length upon the deck, grappled a ring-bolt there, and swore not to let it go, though hacked in pieces. In vain the captain threatened to throw him overboard, suspended a cutlass over his naked wrists. Queequeg was the son of a king, and Queequeg budged not. Struck by his desperate dauntlessness, and his wild desire to visit Christendom, the captain at last relented, and told him he must and told him he might make himself at home. But this fine young savage, the sea prince of Wales, never saw the captain's cabin. They put him down among the sailors and made a whaleman of him. But like Tsar Peter, content to toil in the shipyards of foreign cities, Queequeg disdained no seeming ignominy, if thereby he might happily gain the power of enlightening his untutored countrymen. For at bottom, so he told me, he was actuated by a profound desire to learn among the Christians the arts whereby to make his people still happier than they were, and more than that, still better than they were. But alas, the practices of whalemen soon convinced him that even Christians could be both miserable and wicked, infinitely more so than all his father's heathens. Arrived at last in Old Sag Harbor, and seeing what the sailors did there, and then going on to Nantucket, and seeing how they spent their wages in that place also, poor Queequeg gave it up for lost. Thought he, it's a wicked world in all meridians, I'll die a pagan. And thus an old idolater at heart, he yet lived among these Christians, wore their clothes, and tried to talk their gibberish. Hence the queer ways about him, though now some time from home. By hints, I asked him whether he did not propose going back, and having a coronation, since he might not consider his father dead and gone, he being very old and feeble at the last accounts. He answered no, not yet, and added that his fearful Christianity, or rather Christians, had unfitted him for ascending the pure and undefiled throne of thirty pagan kings before him. But by and by, he said, he would return, as soon as he felt himself baptized again. For the nonce, however, he proposed to sail about and sow his wild oats in all four oceans. He had made a harpooner, they had made a harpooner of him, and that barbed iron was in lieu of a scepter now. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose, touching his future movements. He answered, to go to sea again, in his old vocation. Upon this I told him that whaling was my own design, and informed him of my intentions to sail out of Nantucket, as being the most promising port for an adventurous whaleman to embark, to embark from. He at once resolved to accompany me to that island, ship ship aboard the same vessel, get into the same watch, the same boat, the same mess with me, in short, to share my very hap, with both my hands in his, boldly dip into the potluck of both worlds. To all this I joyously assented, for besides the affection I now felt for Queequeg, he was an experienced harpooner, and as such could not fail to be of great usefulness to one who, like me, was wholly ignorant of the mysteries of whaling, though well acquainted with the sea as known to merchant seamen. His story being ended with his pipe's last dying puff, Queequeg embraced me, pressed his forehead against mine, and blowing out the light, we rolled over from each other, this way and that, and very soon were sleeping. Have a good day, friends.